Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Steve Ferguson, and we're pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. We hope you'll find the next hour so useful and informative. We have developed our webinar series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues that our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize the engineering challenges can be complex, and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, I want to go over a few housekeeping details. First, I hope you can see the title slide on your screen. This presentation is part of the webinar series presented this calendar year. We have muted everyone's microphone to keep the meeting quality as high as possible. Well, my mouse didn't advance. There we go. I'm sorry. Uh, we've muted everyone's microphone to keep the meeting quality as high as possible. A recording of the presentation is underway and will be sent to all registered attendees along with a copy of the presentation. A training certificate will be sent to attendees of the live presentation. A full screen view may be preferred. To select full screen, look at your drop down menu panel and select full screen. To return to normal, press the escape key. We encourage questions during the event. Please, you can submit a question by enabling the chat or Q&A icon at the top or side of your screen and typing your question to the host. We will go through the questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. We will not interrupt the speaker with questions during the event. We'd like to hear from you. You can see our contact information at Academy. Or you can contact the speaker directly, Gregory Zumak, G -A -E Zumak at acbcert.com. We estimate that the main bulk of the presentation will take about one hour. We'll allow some time for questions at the end. I'd like to introduce our speaker. Greg Zumak is a regulatory review engineer for American Certification Body. Greg started in the FCC OE. T, Operational Test uh, Evaluation and Test Laboratory, Equipment Authorization Branch in 1989, eventually leading the Commission to enter into the newly forming TCB community in the year 2000, in which he's been an active member since inception. He has over 25 years of hands-on experience in equipment authorization, including compliance testing, FCC rulemakings, development of test procedures, an application review of cutting edge technologies from the introduction of spread spectrum and Bluetooth to the latest in 4G systems. Greg, welcome. Let me um, take the transition to you. And Greg, you should have control at this point. And let me check your audio. Actually, I think uh, I think you might have handed the ball to Christina. Oh, I'm sorry, I did. <laughs> now I have it correct. Let's do your audio check again. Okay, I'd like to uh, thank you, Steve, for the uh, welcome and for the opportunity to be here this morning or this afternoon to speak with everybody. I'm hoping that I'm still uh, being heard by everyone there. I think I lost a little bit of the audio for a second there. You were silent during that period, but you're back with us, Greg. Oh, okay. Well, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, I can. You're coming for good. You may want to up your volume very slightly. All right, here. I do this a little bit here. Very good. All right, great. Thank you, Steve. All right, well, uh, again, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, uh, Washington Labs and Steve Ferguson for giving me the opportunity to be here today to speak with all of you. Uh, as Steve said, uh, I'm Gregory Chumak. I'm with ACB. We have been with ACB TCB for about two years now. Uh, it's, uh, the introduction that he read is actually a few years old, and I, I hate to admit it, but I've actually been doing equipment authorization for about 28 years at this point. So uh, it's, it's been quite a while that I've been uh, in, involved in this particular field, uh, and I'm uh, more than happy to, to share any experience or information that I have with, with all of you. 
So with that, I guess I think that we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to make sure that uh, my controls are working properly. There we go. So uh, one of my colleagues, Tim Johnson, provided uh, uh, information to you all in a presentation a week ago today. And I know that he spoke about uh, generally the FCC authorization system and the requirements of the uh, general equipment authorization requirements for the FCC. And I think that he broke out uh, the four different potential routes for authorization, the first being no authorization required, the second verification, the third declaration of conformity or DOC, and the fourth one certification. Uh, you don't get to choose which one you'd like to apply to your particular type of equipment, but the FCC rules specify the authorization requirement for every type of equipment in the text and body of the rules themselves. This particular presentation that I will be providing uh, or presenting to you all this morning is going to focus specifically on certification and on the required content of an application that must be filed with the TCB in order to get a device certified. So you've completed the testing of your device and it's time to certify your equipment. You have to create an application to do this. There are different types of FCC certification applications, uh, them being new unlicensed devices, new licensed devices, but then also permissive change devices, class two, class three for software defined radios. Uh, there is another type also, which is a change in ID application, which is a paperwork only application. Uh, for each of these, there are various documents that have to be submitted in support of the application and the specific request that's being made for that piece of equipment. These different documents are referred to by the FCC and in, in, in our industry as exhibits. And the type of certification application that you are filing will dictate the exhibits required for that application. The exhibits themselves comprise the content of the technical application. And we will be going uh, digging into these exhibits specifically, each and every one in detail later in the presentation. So generally though, the exhibits are going to be divided up. You have to take the information about your product and divide it up into separate categories. For example, you're going to have certain application forms that have to be filled out. There will be technical documents, for example, block diagrams, operational descriptions, and the like. All of the different test reports that might be involved in an application. Photographs of the EUP and of the test setup, user's manuals, and then there will also be various types of cover letters that are involved as well. It's important to realize that the application that's being submitted must precisely describe the device. An application should not only partially describe a device or not talk about all of a device's capabilities. And so the FCC rules provide some clear information about exactly what level of detail must be provided in an application in order to adequately describe the device being certified. Unfortunately, it's true that many devices get certified without that level of detail in the application. Uh, typically at this point an oversight perhaps of, of the TCB involved. It's unfortunate though because uh, applications like that that are, that are not complete should not be used as precedent setting applications, but they are regularly. And uh, it, it's a regular difficulty faced by TCBs to ensure that applications do include the level of detail required by the FCC. A very vital aspect of an application is that the technical information that you provide in the various exhibits is consistent across all of the exhibits in the application. You don't want the operational description to say one thing and in the test report to test something completely different. That uh, is actually one of the common problems that we see with these applications. And later in this presentation, I'm going to go through uh, in detail a number of these common issues or problems that we come across. Uh, we'll talk about the best way to avoid them that will be coming up in a little while. Of course, the safest and fastest option is simply to provide the detail that the FCC requires and then avoid further questions or arguments about it. If you just do what they tell you to do, then it's usually the easiest way to get through. You might be able to get some allowances from them in certain areas and things like that, but that will always slow the process down, should that be the case. 
So we had the different types of applications that can be filed, whether it's an unlicensed device, a licensed device, or a permissive change. Those are the three that we'll, we'll focus on today. And uh, I'm going to now talk about the exhibits that are required for these different types of applications. I have lists here, or I have references here in the presentation, and I believe that everyone will be uh, receiving a copy of this, where I reference the specific rule parts. And I certainly recommend that in the future, if you're working on preparing an application, you go back, look at these different rules that I've referenced here, uh, and, and become familiar with them, or acquainted at least with them, because they will certainly, uh, that, that knowledge will certainly aid you in being able to provide a complete application. So the specific, applica the specific application that's being filed might be for a unique device or something a little bit different, in which case there might be some additional exhibits that could be required for it in that case. But for the majority of applications that we see, I'm going to provide you on the next slide the list of exhibits that are required for an unlicensed device, typically a Part 15 or Part 18 device. And I also just wanted to note that these exhibits should be uploaded to the TCD as separate files. In other words, there are three different types of photograph exhibits that are required, external photos, internal photos, and test setup photos. Those should be three individual files that are uploaded as part of the application, because that's the way the TCD is required to upload them then to the FCC uh, website. So here's the actual list of exhibits required for an unlicensed device application, Part 15 or Part 18. We will uh, touch on all of these in some detail in a few minutes. But going through the list, we see the Form 731. This has been the form that's filled out for equipment authorization since, since at least 1989 when I was at the FCC, and that was the form being used. Uh, in addition, there are requirements uh, for exhibits containing block diagrams, various types of cover letters, external photos, internal photos, labeling information, operational description, RF exposure exhibits, schematics, test reports, test setup photos, and the user's manual. Now, if we look at licensed devices as opposed to unlicensed devices, and by licensed devices, we're talking about devices that are going to be certified under other parts of the rules than parts 15 and 18, for example, 22, 24, 27. Those cover most of the rule parts, for example, for modern cell phones and tablets and tablets and the like. Part 80, maritime radios. Part 87 are aeronautical radios. Part 90 is a... a, a, a vast conglomerate of different types of, of business or professional use radios and radio services. These are licensed devices because in addition to receiving equipment authorization, uh, before that device can be employed, a, a, use, a user license must also be obtained. We're not going to be talking about that. We're focusing today, of course, on the equipment authorization aspect of it. But for licensed devices, in addition to those exhibits that we just listed already for the unlicensed devices, there are also some additional things that are required. Uh, that includes the tune-up procedure for the transmitter, a parts list or a, a bill of materials, information regarding DC voltages and currents, and, and that's in, in certain circumstances more important than others, uh, description of the modulation techniques being used, descriptions of the circuitry and devices for determining and stabilizing frequency, suppression of spurious emissions, and limiting modulation of power. So a little bit more detail required for one of these licensed type devices. Now, in addition, depending on the specific type of device, there are still some further exhibits that may be required. For analog devices, and truth be told, we don't really see too many AM or FM radios coming in for authorization anymore. To be honest, I don't even remember the last FM radio that I, uh, that I uh, approved. It's probably been 10 years or, or, or close to it. However, it's, it's certainly still an option. And in that case, there are additional tests that have to be performed, including audio frequency response, modulation limiting, audio low pass filter response. These are specified in the rules. Also, for certain Part 90 devices, there is the infamous transient frequency response test that 
so many people struggled with for a long time when it was first introduced. It's uh, become pretty common and easy but now, and I think most devices don't have too much difficulty in complying with it. So these are additional requirements or additional exhibits that will be required for a licensed device. And the footnote here is, I had said earlier that the list of exhibits required for an unlicensed device also apply to the licensed devices. There was a single exception to that, and that's test setup photos. Uh, I honestly think that that might have been an oversight on the part of the FCC when those rules were being written, because the test setup photos are, are deemed as extremely important by the FCC staff. So even though they are not technically required for licensed devices, it's still highly recommended that they be included in the application in any event. If they're not, then oftentimes you're going to get the PCB and or the FCC question the uh, applicant or the test lab about their lack. So the third type of applications that I uh, talked about earlier were permissive change applications. And again, these are uh, for, for, for Part 15 and Part 18 devices. You can look in 2.1043, and it talks about the more general certification requirements for the exhibits that are required. The same can be applied to the permissive changes. Uh, there's going to be always a Form 731 that's required. Anytime an application is submitted, there must be a Form 731. For permissive change, we're going to look also, it's very important, for the cover letter which explains in detail the proposed modifications to the device and how these modifications meet the requirements of 2.1043 that are specified for permissive changes. Uh, the additional exhibits that must be submitted for a permissive change application will vary primarily depending on what the specific modification is. For example, if the modification is something that cannot be seen, in other words, maybe there's a change in software that changed some operating parameters, or a, a, a changes that, are, that are, are so small that they cannot actually be seen you know, visually when you look at a board, uh, if the changes cannot be seen at all, then there's no need to submit new photographs. The photographs that are already on file with the FCC for that device, in other words, remain applicable to the modified device. On the other hand, if the modifications do change the appearance of the device, then new photographs should be submitted to document that, that modification so that the FCC's file for that device is always kept up to date. And that's certainly in the best interest of the applicant. And so far more important for the applicant to do that than it is for the FCC. So uh, that's a, a recommendation to make sure that your file with the FCC is always maintained in a current, up-to-date manner. Uh, the same way with the block diagrams or the schematics, if the proposed modifications can be seen, if they result in a change to the schematics or the block diagram, then new exhibits for those should be submitted, potentially with a confidentiality request letter. And we'll talk about that in some detail a little bit later. And finally, the user's manual. If there have been changes or modifications that, for example, changed the minimum separation distance required for RF exposure compliance. Perhaps a new antenna is being added for use with the device, and this new antenna has a greater required minimum separation distance for, for RF exposure compliance, then that information must be updated to the user uh, and or installer in the manual. And so a revised or a new manual would then have to be submitted with the permissive change application showing the updated information to the user or installer. So excuse me. Uh, let's let's unpack this a little bit now and start digging into these specific exhibits. The first one I want to talk about, of course, and this is the one that I mentioned is always required for every application is the Form 731. Uh, please note that this form, when you submit it to the PCB, the form itself is not uploaded to the FCC website as the other exhibits are. Rather, the PCB must manually enter all of that information into the FCC's uh, website for that device or for that application. And so it's important that the information, of course, on the 731 be accurate. The uh, PCB is then required to keep that document that the applicant submitted with the application. And when we are assessed annually uh, for our 17065 assessment, 
this is one of the things that the assessors will look for in the applications is to ensure that we have copies of a 731 for every application that we've received. Um, and it's very important also that that 731 be signed. So uh, if, if it's not signed, it's going to be sent back to you by the PCB or it should be sent back to you by the PCB to ask uh, that you sign the document and then resubmit it. Uh, the FCC ID number is listed on the device, the applicant's name, of course, their contact information, the FRN, which is the FCC registration number when an applicant uh, uh, requests or applies for a grantee code. They're also uh, applying for it granted an FRN, and that's a, I think it's a 10-digit number, as I recall, that's used in all of the financial transactions between the FCC and the applicant. So that FRN must also be included in the Form 731. There will be technical information about the device, power, the frequency, and things like that that also must be on the Form 731. In addition, there are other things that you must fill out. And one of those is the option for confidential treatment that might be afforded to certain exhibits within the application. And I will talk about this in some detail later as well. But basically, the United States has something called the Freedom of Information Act. This act was passed back in the I want to say 1980s at some point. It's, it's been around for quite some time now. But basically what it does and the way it affects, at least, for example, the FCC is it uh, gives the right for every U.S. citizen to have access to the non-proprietary proprietary exhibits that were submitted in an application, for example, for equipment authorization. This includes all of the test results. Uh, that were submitted in support of that device's uh, compliance with the technical requirements. Test results, for example, must always be available to the public. Other aspects of the application must also always be available to the public. Now, proprietary information, on the other hand, is not necessarily made available to the public through the Freedom of Information Act. And so Things that are truly proprietary, detailed operational descriptions, block diagrams, schematics, parts lists, things of that nature, they can be withheld from public access on the FCC website. In order to do so, you must submit a specific confidentiality request. You must indicate this on the Form 731 and then also submit a confidentiality request letter that we will talk about in just a few minutes. Another type of confidentiality that uh, can be afforded to certain types of exhibits is called short-term confidentiality. And this is the type of thing where uh, if somebody is submitting an application to get a particular device certified, but they don't plan on releasing that device and, and shipping it and beginning to market it for another six months, maybe they've got a big release date planned and some announcements, uh, you know, uh, things of that nature. In that case, they might not want all of that information about their device available to the public ahead of their release date, or they're at the beginning of their marketing of the device. And so in that case, they can request that certain exhibits be afforded short-term confidentiality. They will be held confidential or withheld from the public view from the time the application is granted up until the point that the device begins to be marketed. Once the device has, has begun to be marketed, then all of those exhibits that were held under short-term confidentiality will be placed in the public file so the public can access it. Uh, and here we're talking about uh, things like photographs of the device or the user's manual, the type of things that, that a company might want to withhold until they announce the actual device. Moving down on the Form 731, you must also enter the equipment class for the equipment for which you are seeking authorization or certification. Uh, there may be multiple different equipment classes for, in, that apply to a particular device. But the way the FCC rules and regulations are set up, there is one FCC grant issued per equipment class. This can be a little bit confusing. As I said, more than one equipment class can apply to a single device. Uh, a simple example is a cell phone. A typical smartphone is going to have multiple licensed transmitters in there uh, under GSM, CDMA, wide CDMA, 
uh, LTE and all of its different flavors, bandwidth and bands, the uh, other GSM, YTDMA can also operate in multiple bands. Uh, and they will have a 5 gigahertz NII transmitter for their Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz UTS transmitter for the Wi-Fi, uh, Blue P, Blue P's LE. All of these different things uh, will require separate equipment classes. Uh, and there will be a separate grant issue uh, for each of those equipment classes. So a single smartphone will oftentimes have perhaps five or six equipment classes. So five or six grants will be issued, all with the same FCC ID number, but with a different equipment class for each, covering those different aspects of the device. Separate exhibits have to be submitted for each of these equipment classes if the exhibits are not applicable to all. In other words, you only need to submit one set of photographs because one set of photographs should detail the entire device. So that same set of photographs could then be applicable to uh, each of the different uh, equipment classes. However, different equipment classes might have slightly different requirement operating requirements. So maybe they have different attestations that are required of them. In those cases, those individual separate things must be also submitted for, in the application for each of the individual equipment classes. Here uh, we have just a list of some examples of equipment classes and the specific rule part uh, under which those devices are authorized. Uh, common transmitters, low power transmitters operating in the ISM bands under 15249 could be a DXX or a DXT, which is a transceiver, versus a DXX is the transmitter only. Uh, security remote control devices under 15231 are typically DSCs or DSRs. Uh, 15247 wireless LAN is a DTS, a Bluetooth is a DSS, and if it has Bluetooth LE, a DTS, et cetera, et cetera. And you can go through and take a look at these. The um, link that I have towards the bottom there uh, takes you to a page of the FCC website, uh, which is actually multiple pages, which actually lists every different rule section and rule part and the applicable equipment classes for those. So. That's an extremely useful list. If you have a device that you know has multiple types of uh, 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 transmitters in it, for example, and you're not completely sure about what the correct equipment class would be, go to the list here at this link, and you will be able to easily find the specific section or rule part under which the device is being authorized and look across the table and see what the correct equipment classes should be for that rule section or rule part. And again, a composite device, as defined by the FCC, is a device that has more than one equipment class. And so a composite device will receive multiple grants, one for each equipment class, as I mentioned, in the device. Cover letters. There are various types of cover, le cover letters that will be required in an application. Um, a main cover letter, oftentimes, while not required, it is provided by people that just use kind of an introduction saying, you need hereby submit this application for authorization. And that's, that's fine. Uh, it's not actually one of the letters that's required by the FCC, though. The FCC does require a, for example, confidentiality request letter if you desire to hold some proprietary exhibits confidential or withhold them from, from public access. Um, there's a KDB publication, and I believe that Tim Johnson uh, talked about KDBs and talked about how to find them and locate them on the FCC website in his presentation last week. But uh, that KDB number there, 726920, uh, gives you all of the information, everything you ever wanted to know about confidentiality requests, but we're afraid to ask. It's uh, very detailed in there and uh, very clearly written, I think, as well. So, certainly recommend that anytime you are preparing an application for which there will be some confidential uh, exhibits submitted, that you uh, take a look at this particular KDB publication and make sure that uh, you've got your I's dotted and T's crossed. Uh, there is also a required agent authorization letter. I believe, again, this is probably something Tim touched on last week, but for every grantee code, when, it, when an applicant applies for and obtains a grantee code from the FCC, they are required to provide a single person who is the point of contact for the FCC for that grantee code. Uh, you can see these, there's a list 
um, or actually there's a, a search uh, function on the FCC website where you can pull up the point of contact and see who that is and for every grantee code. Um, the documentation in the application is supposed to be signed by that point of contact and that point of contact only. If somebody else signs any of the documentation, then there must be an agent authorization letter that is signed by the point of contact and authorizes either an organization or specific person or persons to sign documents on their behalf for their FCC equipment authorization application. And that's very important that we are to see that agent authorization there signed by the point of contact to allow either the agent or the lab or some other people to sign on their behalf. There are other cover letters that could be uh, required as well. There's a modular request cover letter that's required for modular approval author, uh, applications. The class two permissive change cover letter uh, that specifies the proposed mod modifications in the class two per permissive change. Uh, justification for requirements for professional installation under 15203, et cetera. In other words, there will be certain specific rule sections and rule parts that might require a cover letter that, that be included in the application. Next required exhibit is the block diagram. Uh, this is mandatory for Part 15 devices and Part 18 devices. It's optional for licensed devices. However, it's highly recommended that you still include a block diagram. This is one of the primary tools that a reviewer will use in trying to figure out exactly what the device is. And so again, if you want to avoid a lot of potential questions, I would definitely recommend that you submit the block diagram for the licensed devices, the licensed transmitters as well. And if at all possible, please don't just submit something that has a box with the letters TX written in the middle of it and leave that as your, your block diagram. We are indeed hoping for at least a little bit more detail than that. If you read the rule requirement, it talks about an extensive amount of detail that, that should be included in the block diagram. This rule was written probably 30 years ago. Uh, since that time, we now have transmitters that are resident on a single chip. And I understand that if an applicant or a manufacturer has bought these chips from a chip manufacturer, they might not have access to a detailed block diagram of what's going on inside that chip. In a situation like that, if all that you have is if you can write TX on there, then that's what you do. But certainly the block diagram should show all of the different types of devices or circuits or, or, or components connected to that transmitter chip. So at least it puts it in context a little bit. An operational description. This is required for all devices and all applications submitted to the FCC of every different flavor. Uh, the operational description is, is oftentimes the most incomplete exhibit that we find. It, it's, it's usually uh, uh, lacking in, in a number of different ways. Uh, it's nevertheless a very important exhibit. The FCC considers it extremely important as well, the operational description is not just a data sheet, but rather it, it, could, it might include a data sheet for the device, but uh, there are other things that must be included as well, and that uh, is, for example, listing all of the EEP's capabilities and then specifying which capabilities are being implemented in this particular application. Um, that's a very important aspect of an operational description. If you take a look there, the rule sections there that I, I have listed are, are, are the rule sections that specify this requirement, both for unlicensed and licensed devices. Information that really should be included in that operational description includes, uh, but is not limited to, the output power, or at least the target output power, the channels used or the frequency bands used by the device, uh, the timing of the device and the way it operates, the modulation that it employs, or the different types of modulation, and operating modes, data rates. Uh, this is important also, the intended use of the device. What is the intent of this device? How will it be used? By whom will it be used? And for what purpose will it be used? Information on the antenna, and then also demonstrations of compliance with various non-measurement requirements. And a lot of the rules also have requirements, for example, 
security and remote control devices have polling and supervision transmission requirements that should be detailed in the operational description. Frequency hopping devices under 15247 have a number of operational requirements dealing, for example, with input bandwidth to the receiver and the ability to hop in synchronization with the transmitter. Those are the types of things that should be included in the operational description, as well as any potential marketing restrictions that ex exist, for example, for certain types of ultra-wideband devices. After that, we have schematic diagrams. This should be pretty straightforward. It's the circuit diagrams, typically of the transmitter being certified. It's required for all transmitters, both licensed and unlicensed. That's a pretty straightforward requirement. The parts list. This is something that is required for licensed devices that is optional for Part 15 transmitters. It does not have to be submitted for Part 15 transmitters, but it may be should the applicant choose to do so. Tune-up procedure. I think that there oftentimes is a lot of confusion about this particular requirement, and part of that has to do with the, the language in the rules. Uh, realize that, again, this is something that was probably, this tune-up procedure requirement was written back in the 1940s. Uh, in the 1940s and 50s, when transmitters, which were big, bulky things that were used for primarily for broadcast purposes, uh, TV and radio, but when they were installed, the transmitter was actually tuned at the installation site, and there were procedures followed for the tuning of that type of device in, in those situations. And that's, at the time, what the FCC was looking for. Uh, today, as I said, with, with most transmitters being resident on a chip, there's real, no real tuning that goes on according to that. But the information from that old tuning procedure that is still of great importance today is primarily the maximum output power target level of the transmitter in all of its different modes of operation, and then whatever the manufacturing tolerance is that the manufacturer or the applicant sets for it. It might be a dB, 2 dB, 10%, whatever the case might be. So really, today, when we look for a tune-up procedure, the primary information we're really looking for are those maximum output power target levels, one for each different mode or modulation, uh, if it changes for different modes and modulations, as it often does, for example, in 802.11, B, G, N, and A, C, and all of those. Um, that's really the important information that should be included in the tune-up procedure. If you don't have anything other than all of your output power target values and your uh, manufacturing tolerance, that is typically still considered sufficient for the tune-up procedure document. External photos, again, this is one of the things that's required for all devices, licensed and unlicensed. Uh, the rule sections here give some uh, specific requirements for the size of the photos. Again, since everything nowadays is electronic and PDF, a lot of this is uh, not as important, but uh, it is important that the photos be clear and show all size of the device all of the user controls available on it, all of the ports or other features that might be anywhere located on the outside of the device. Internal photos, likewise, are required for everything. Uh, it's important that both sides of every PC board or print circuit board are being shown uh, in photographs in there. If there are shields or RF shields on any components, as they typically, there typically will be in the case of transmitters, then additional photos are also required with those shields removed. Uh, and finally, there should also be uh, at least one photo showing the general internal construction of the device, how the different boards are laid out, how they're interconnected with other components of the device. In other words, something like taking the lid off of the device and taking a photo like that, and not simply providing just photos of both sides of the boards already removed. A label is uh, certainly required for a device as well. These uh, labels uh, are, are specified, the requirements are specified in the KDD that I have listed there. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I uh, see I'm running short on time here a little bit, so I'm going to move a little bit quicker through some of these so we can make sure to get to the uh, common errors that we see later. But uh, a label is always required as well, and that KDD specifies all the requirements that you need to know for that label. 
the location of the label has to be shown as well in the uh, label exhibit. If the label is placed in the battery compartment, for example, like with a cell phone, then the device, this is only permitted if the device is shipped without the battery installed. In other words, the user is going to have some reason to open that battery compartment and see the FCC ID number as they are installing the battery. In addition, the label that bears the FCC ID cannot be attached to a removable part of the device. So it's not permitted to attach that to a, um, a battery cover, but the battery cover can come off. Uh, as they oftentimes can. I think every TV remote control in my house uh, has a, a, a piece of tape holding the batteries, and at this point, the, the battery covers have been removed. So you're not permitted to put ID numbers or labels on removable portions like that. And again, the rule sections listed here specify the requirements for licensed and unlicensed devices and the labeling requirements for those devices. There must be an RF exposure exhibit. And I believe that uh, Tim Johnson covered this uh, in a little bit of detail last week. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail today. To be honest with you, RF exposure is, is an entire day's worth of, 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 of presentation, if not more. So uh, we're going to just touch on a few aspects of it right here. Primarily uh, the fact that whether you're making MPE calculations or MPE measurements or SAR measurements, in each of these cases, the calculations or the measurements must be scaled up to account for the maximum target output power level of the device. You cannot simply use the measured RF output power level that you measured in the lab in your MPE calculations. Uh, the RF exposure calculations and measurements are supposed to be applicable to every device coming off of the assembly line. And so as a result, it is always the maximum output power target level plus any tolerance that is used both in the MPE calculations and also to scale up MPE and SAR measurements to make them equivalent to the levels that would be seen if the device were indeed operating at the maximum target output power level plus tolerance. Of course, an EMC report is also required. Uh, the uh, specifics uh, uh, are listed there in, in the uh, rule section listed. Also, ISO 17025, of course, uh, which is uh, required for the accreditation of test labs, also specifies the information that should be included in the test reports as well. Um, and it's important to note that the manufacturer must support all of the information in the test report. There are many times and in instances when a test lab will perform tests on a device to submit the test report as part of the application, and the manufacturer or the applicant is not even aware of what the test results are for their device. They don't know what their output power is measured to be or, or things like that. And, and uh, it should uh, uh, be uh, it noted that the applicant must, is always responsible for all of the information in the application even if somebody else submitted that application on their behalf. And uh, that's pretty much what I was talking about on this slide as well. So we'll keep moving along to make sure we get through things here. The test setup photos are also required. This is, has to be something separate, a separate exhibit from the test report. So if you have them embedded in your test report, you must also submit a separate file with them extracted that can be used as the test setup photograph exhibit. Uh, typically, we want to see all sides of the, of the test setup, particularly if there are multiple devices on the table. We want to make sure that we can see all of the cabling and connections between those devices. This is both for radiated emissions and AC line conductive emissions. And as I mentioned earlier, while this is not required for licensed devices, it's always recommended that you still include them nonetheless. The user's manual finally must be provided for all of these things as well. The user's manual must contain the required compliance statements. I list a number of them there for Part 15 devices. There's also RF exposure information that must be included in the manual. For example, listing the minimum separation distances required for RF exposure compliance, whether that be for uh, mobile devices where it might be some distance 20 centimeters or greater or uh, for portable devices that are perhaps even worn on the body where there must be uh, 
perhaps your device may be tested while it was touching the body, but if it was tested with a one centimeter separation distance, for example, then that information must be included to the user to let them know that in order to comply with RF, RF exposure requirements, a minimum separation distance of one centimeter must be maintained when the device is body worn. If you have a modular device, then the manual, the installation manual must include detailed information on how that module uh, is to be installed. And in no case may the manual include misleading or incorrect information about the device. In other words, the user must always be told exactly what the device is and how it has to be operated and used to be compliant. So quickly, we're going to go through common errors that we see in these applications. Um, and again, you all can go through these in some detail yourselves since you all will be getting copies of, of this presentation. The vast majority of errors that we encounter at the PCB when we review applications are either administrative in nature or they stem from a lack, from a lack of consistency across the different exhibits within the application, as I had mentioned earlier. Certainly there is a, 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 you know, a percentage of times when testing is performed incorrectly, but that's usually not as often. Most of the test labs that, that are out there doing this type of work have a pretty good idea of what, what they're required to do. And so typically it's more administrative or reporting in nature or, or, or lack of consistency between exhibits that we tend to see. The first uh, error that, that's very common is that certain exhibits are missing. Not all the necessary exhibits have been provided. So if you are an applicant or a test lab or an agent or the person who is submitting the application to the PCB, you want to make sure that all of the exhibits that we talked about in the previous slides are included. Those required for the type of application that you're submitting are included in that application. On the Form 731, many times we see that the technical information, like the output power or the frequency band that's been listed on the Form 731, doesn't match what is listed, for example, in the operational description or in the test report. So we want to make sure that there is always a, a, a correspondence between the information listed on the Form 731 and the information found in the test report supporting that. Uh, also, for licensed transmitters, there's additional information that has to be included on the Form 731, and that includes the emission designator and the frequency tolerance. And again, that's for every type of emission uh, of that licensed device. Inconsistencies regarding the FCC ID number are also quite common. And again, between what we see listed on the Form 731, what we see listed in the label exhibit, and what we see listed, for example, in the test report. These numbers must be identical in each case. They must always be uppercase, uppercase characters. Um, be careful not to add a dash between the grantee code and the product code if there is no dash on the label in the, in, or the, in the intent of the applicant is to not have a dash there. So be careful when you look at the ID numbers, make sure that they are identical throughout the application. Another problem that we see with labels um, regularly is that uh, they are of insufficient quality for us to actually be able to read the FCC ID number and make sure that it is correct. Um, many times this is just because the, the photograph that was taken of the label is of, of poor resolution or perhaps during the PDF process uh, it lost some of that resolution. But if you can't clearly tell the difference between an I and a 1 or a B and an 8, then uh, the, the exhibit is not sufficient. You must be able to clearly see each of the numbers and characters in the FCC ID number. A very, very common issue that we see is the DOC logo. Remember, the DOC is a different form of equipment authorization, separate from certification. A DOC does not receive an FCC ID number, but instead they put that DOC logo on the device. Um, a lot of manufacturers see that and say, oh, that looks nice. I'd like to put that on my device also. And they put it on their device, which is being certified. Um, this, the FCC has fits about this. 
a DOC is a specific type of authorization. When you put that DOC logo on a device, it carries legal implications um, that are not being fulfilled if that device is in actuality being certified. And so this is something that we see regularly and we have to tell people all the time, the FCC requires that you remove that DOC logo from your label if DOC is not applicable to the device. Issues with block diagrams. Oftentimes, uh, the, the, the primary issue that we see is the rules require that all clock, crystal, and oscillator frequency values used in the device are listed on the block diagram. And oftentimes, we don't see any of them, or maybe we'll just see one. And it's important to realize that um, this includes both the block die or both, both the crystals or oscillators used by the transmit and receive portion of the device, but also by the digital baseband portion of the device. And so if you've got a clock in there running your CPU that's just for your baseband stuff, you must also report that clock level or that clock value on the block diagram as well. External photos, typical problem that we see with those is simply that not enough photos were submitted that you can see all of the features of the device. Many times people will give uh, a single external photo kind of showing the front and top of the device sitting on the table. Uh, but if you can't see the back, you can't tell what kind of ports are there, what type of user controls might be present. So we really want to see all sides of the device that so that all such features can be seen. In some certain circumstances, you might be able to take a single photo and show multiple sides of the device depending on its shape and size but with a single photo. In, 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 that, in that case, that's fine, again, so long as all features can be seen on those sides or if there are no features or controls or ports, then that can be seen as well. Internal photos, uh, people commonly forget that we are required to have photos of both sides of all PC uh, print circuit boards. And so uh, th that's a very common error that, that people forget to show us photos in the back of the, of the PCB or that they forget to remove the, uh, the shielding, the RF shielding over the transmit circuitry. So those are very common errors. We have to have photos of both sides of those PCBs and we have to see uh, what those things, what the circuitry looks like underneath those RF shields as well. And again, just the, the fact that, that many times we are submitted photos uh, PDF uh, versions of photos that are just fuzzy or poor resolution. And uh, it's important to remember that that process of, of PDFing a photograph can oftentimes result in the loss of some resolution. So after you PDF those photos, make sure you take one more look at them to make sure that they are still as sharp as they need to be. Schematics, a typical problem that we see is the actual values for the components are not listed. Uh, you have to make sure that it's not just um, reference designators, R1 and R2, but the actual values for the components are shown in the schematic diagrams. Uh, a couple of different issues we come across with user's manuals. Uh, one is that all of the required compliance statements are not included. And uh, this is obviously one of the first things that we look for. So make sure that when you uh, are submitting that manual, that the various statements required by the rules for your device are indeed included in the manual. Uh, the other problem that we regularly see, uh, or another problem that we regularly see, is uh, with regard to RF exposure compliance for mobile and portable devices, we want to make sure that the statements are in there that specifically state that in order to comply with RF exposure requirements, the minimum separation distance, or whatever that distance has been calculated or measured to be, is accurately listed in the manual. Some manufacturers will list a slightly greater distance because they want to you know, err on the side of safety. And the FCC has said, you know, that's okay. They will accept that uh, if, if measurements or calculations show that 20 centimeters is all that's required, for example, for, for a separation distance to maintain compliance. If you put three meters, in the manual, then the FCC in a situation like that would like to see some type of cover letter saying, we recognize the fact that only 20 centimeters is required, but we want to go way above and beyond that, and so that's why we listed this amount in the manual. So if it's way over, then some justification should be included. Uh, same for portable devices that are used closer than 20 centimeters. 
again, depending on what the separation distance is used for the SAR testing, that distance or slightly greater must be accurately listed in the manual as well. Uh, and finally, when it comes to things like cell phones and tablets, uh, there's a lot of complicated information that the carriers require uh, be included in the user's manual. Uh, and that's fine. The FCC doesn't care about other information that's included in there. However, they want to make sure that the information that is included in there are um, regarding approved body-worn conditions, accessories, and distances required for compliance. Uh, if the FCC ID is listed in the manual, it must be correct. If the max SAR levels are listed in the manual, as many carriers do require, then you must make sure that those SAR levels match the levels shown in the SAR report. And uh, just note that the FCC does not require that the FCC ID number or maximum SAR levels be included in the manuals, but because many carriers require it, the applicants are putting it in there. Confidentiality request. I think that Tim talked about this as well last week, and there's a number of issues uh, that come up about confidentiality requests. Uh, the KDB is listed here again, 726920. Typically, people fail to to cite the correct rule sections, 0.459 and 457, or they forget to mention that you must always provide a reason why you're requesting confidential treatment. And it's typically something like, this is proprietary information, not normally made available to the public. Doing so would cause financial harm to our organization. And that is a, a sufficient uh, reason for, for, for requesting confidential treatment for proprietary information. So make sure that your letters cite these things correctly. Um, I, I go into some detail here talking about the specific types of exhibits that can be afforded confidential treatment. And I think I talked about this earlier. And then other exhibits that can never be afforded confidential treatment, such as the test reports or the labeling exhibit. So uh, that's what these slides here all go over again in detail. But I believe I've spoken about all of these things already. Um, Getting close to the end here, uh, class two permissive change letters that we see oftentimes do not accurately or precisely describe the proposed modifications that have been made to the device. So if you're changing out an IC chip uh, in your transmitter, then the letter should not simply say an IC was changed, but rather you should provide details on saying which IC was changed, what its purpose is, and why it was necessary to change it. In other words, uh, we resourced the manufacturer and we're using a pin for pin compatible IC chip uh, now from a different manufacturer, whatever the case might be. But there should be some information, some detailed information included that talks about precisely what the modifications are that are being made to the device uh, that change it from its original authorization. For modular approvals, many times the modular approval letter is missing. And this is simply the letter that spells out the requirements for modules as specified in 15.212. So if it's a modular approval, we always need to see one of these letters in there with it. Finally, I'm just going to touch on a few of the issues that we run across in test reports. Uh, the first one is what I've been talking about through most of this presentation, that there is technical information in the test report that contradicts information provided in other exhibits of the application. Uh, for example, the operational description might say we support 802.11bg, N20, N40, and AC80. And then we'll open up the test report and say, and it says, we have tested BG and N20 because that's all the device supports. Uh, well, the operational description says it also supports a 40 and 80 megahertz mode, but there's no data covering that in the report. So we have an inconsistency here. And this is uh, a very, very common issue that we run across. We always want to make sure that all of the technical information about the device is consistent across all exhibits in the application. Uh, another common issue we see with test reports is that they fail to list the test procedure utilized. For example, ANSI C63.4 2014, including the, the year uh, of publication of the particular um, procedure that was used. So we want to make sure that you list the procedures there. If you're using specific procedures from within, for example, C63.10, list the section number that has that, that exact procedure in there, and then make sure that the report accurately follows the steps of the procedure. 
Um, and then finally here we see many times that there are inconsistencies within the report itself regarding the capable modes of operation or data rates. Uh, the beginning of the report might describe the device in one way, but then when we get to the data later, we see modes, uh, you know, data for modes that were not in the original description uh, earlier in the report. So we want to make sure that the report is self-consistent across the entire, uh, from, from cover to cover. Uh, lastly, a big issue that we've run into in the past is file size. The FCC has a limit of six megabytes for any particular file. So please be sure that when you upload files to the PCB that they do not exceed six, megabits, six megabytes in size. Now, for certain things like test reports, you might not be able to make them that small. In that case, you'll have to divide the report up into multiple files. And uh, you want to just make sure in that case that in the file name, you make it clear uh, EM, you know, DXX EMC report part one, DXX EMC report part two, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no confusion as to which file is, it, it, it goes in which order in the report. So you finish your application and you have to submit this application to a PCB for review. You can go at, to this link on the FCC website where they will provide you uh, with a searchable database for all of the PCBs that are currently uh, eligible to be FCC certifications. Uh, we think it's important that you choose a PCB and then try and develop a working relationship with them. You want to become familiar with them and they become familiar with you. If the more familiar the PCB is with your products and exhibits, it will speed the review of applications. Uh, the learning curve that takes place both between the reviewer and the applicant uh, then allows them to, to move forward with other applications in a more rapid manner. Uh, and some PCBs indeed will help educate you during the review process so that the applicant or lab or agent better understands all of the requirements uh, that are in place. And so by developing a relationship with the PCB, there are these additional advantages uh, that, that come into play. And that pretty much ends my presentation. I believe I'm ran over by about two minutes. I apologize for that. Uh, there's a lot of information to be covered when you're reviewing an application. And uh, I'll just finish this up by saying that uh, don't be surprised if some of these big applications take a long time to review. A typical smartphone application with all of the different tests and documentation that's provided might take a test lab literally two or three hundred man hours to, to, to do all the testing and put all the information together and submit it. Something that took 300 man hours to prepare is not going to be something that can be reviewed in two hours. And so for applications like that, it might be a, a two to three day process. So don't be surprised by that. It really big applications indeed will take longer to review. Um, again, that's pretty much all I have to say in an hour on this topic. Uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to uh, try and answer any questions. And uh, if uh, you don't have any questions right now, but in going through this presentation later, you come across any questions about any of the topics uh, that I've touched upon, then please don't hesitate to contact me about that. My contact information there uh, is on this final slide along with the ACB website. Uh, we would be more than happy to answer any questions you might have about these things and support you in any way uh, regarding application uh, process. Well, Greg, so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we did get a couple of questions in. If you've got a couple of minutes for me to touch on those. I sure do. Uh, does the ECB offer training in preparing applications? And if so, is this training online? Um, yes. And no, not yet, I believe. Uh, certainly ACB uh, does provide training. We, we um, usually, uh, again, and this goes back to that, that, that relationship that we like to develop between the TCB and the, um, my computer's trying to restart. Sorry about that. Uh, the, the personal relationship or the working relationship that we develop between the TCB and either the manufacturer or the test lab um, is it, very important. It, it really makes the work go much smoother. And so as a result, up until now, the training that ACB provides is usually in person. For example, last month, I traveled up to Montreal uh, uh, for a test lab and requested some training. We provided, and I provided a couple of days of training to them there. So 
ACB does provide training, but up until now, this has always been in person. Uh, the possibility of doing something online is something that you know maybe we can continue to work with Steve and, and develop future things here through, through this uh, program that's already in place. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, that's, uh, I haven't given that much thought, to be honest with you, and it's probably not something that I would be the person in charge of doing that in any event. But well, um, that's certainly question. do provide the training. Now that the question is there about online, I'm going to explore that uh, opportunity. I think that uh, with the academy, we can uh, help it should be developed such. Exactly. Uh, another item came in. Uh, does the operational description apply to the radio only, or does a complete device, including accessories? Typically, the operational description will, will apply to um, specifically the portion of the device that's being authorized. So oftentimes that will just be the radio. However, um, it should also still include some information about the, what the overall device does, the intended use. Uh, I've seen people submit an operation description that say, our device is going to use an 802.11 uh, BGN, 2.4 gigahertz uh, radio. It's a couple of chips we're buying, you know, you know, and uh, that's it. And that's all fine and good, and I can you know, get information about that radio then, but they never told me what their device was. And I have no idea what they're going to be using the radio to do. And so the, the, the bulk of the details should be specifically about, in, in this case here, the radio, the transmitter and or receiver. However, there should at least be some information about the intended use of the overall device, the circumstances in which it will be used, the way in which it will be used, and, and things of that nature. Okay. Um, do routes to compliance, such as the DOC, require T TCB approval? No. The only one that requires TCB approval there is certification. Uh, a verification, which is uh, one of the easiest ones, and that's, that's basically like a, a, a simple, uh, the manufacturer takes the device to a lab, has the device tested, and then simply, if it complies, keeps those test results on file. And then there's no application made to the TCB or the FCC. There, there are indeed some labeling requirements for such a device, but there's no application required. The same with DOC. For DOC, you are, there are certain specific labs to which you must go that are permitted to perform DOC testing. Once the DOC testing has been performed and the device has been properly labeled for DOC, again, there is no submittal for that to the FCC or to the TCB. It's only for certification that we deal with uh, equipment authorization certification or applications. Okay. Uh, one more quick one here. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the permissive change for alternate uh, components. Can a alternate component be used in the initial application where two different modules could be used either or? Absolutely, absolutely. And indeed, uh, that is really what the FCC always recommends, that if at all possible, cover all of your bases at your time of initial, initial authorization. And that just speeds things up. It doesn't require that you go back for reauthorization in the future. So if you already know that you might have this, this chip or that chip or this module or that module, you know, they're both possible, then uh, I, I would highly recommend that you have them both tested initially and you submit all that information uh, in the initial application and then you're covered down the road. You don't have to go back to a PCB or the FCC uh, to, to switch them in or out. So. Okay. Do you have any basic information regarding the applicability of certification to military radios? Military radios, okay. The FCC, uh, according to uh, their congressional mandate when they were created, the, the FCC deals specifically with uh, the general public and consumer devices. And the spectrum which the FCC governs is specifically the spectrum allocated for private use, for consumer devices, and general public use. There is another organization, NTIA, that governs the portion of spectrum that is used by specifically the government, and the military, and typically um, uh, uh, police 
police and fire and, and things of that nature, first responders, um, things like that. Um, the military specifically uses um, um, military bands, and so the mil specs are, are completely a separate thing from certification. On occasion, over the years, I have seen um, you know, for certain specific types of devices, the military actually did come at, at one time occasionally to the FCC when I was there because they w were hoping to get an FCC authorization even though it was strictly going to be a military device and had something to do with a contractual agreement in the base where it was going to be deployed or some such thing. And so on occasion, you will see a military type device apply for certification. But generally, that is not required. That's a totally separate animal. And Steve, I think you've got a lot more experience with that whole side of things than I do. So. Well, I, uh, I don't typically do the radio approval part of that. Uh, typically, uh, that goes through the NTA, as you mentioned. So, but uh, that's very good. Uh, we'll be exploring that also as uh, time comes. Um, I don't have any other questions at this point. Uh, I certainly would like to take the control, uh, Greg, and right, go over on. Okay, okay. excellent. Okay, so I've got the control. I do want to go through one more item here uh, regarding uh, upcoming training. Uh, Next week, we continue this wireless technology series on the 26th with the Radio Equipment Directive presented by Mike uh, Darby out of uh, the UK, ACB Europe. Uh, product safety uh, next week is electrical safety. We just finished the uh, initial thing for this year on the uh, uh, ratings and labeling, et cetera. Uh, Mill Standard 461 hands-on course is slated for May 16th. Uh, I currently have uh, five seats available left, and it's the last offering. I'm going to retire this course uh, as we see it today because the uh, aging of the presenter, me, and the physical demands are becoming to the point where I need to come up with another way to look into this thing. We also have some environmental things coming up. And earlier this year, we did a battery technology thing that was so well received and so many follow-ons that we've decided to repeat that in September. An excellent subject if your device uses any battery technology. Remember that the uh, Symposium on Product uh, Compliance Engineering is May 8th in San Jose, California, and the EMC Society Symposium 2017 is August 17th in Washington, D.C. We would like to hear from you about subjects that we may not know about. Uh, we had a question come in uh, a while back, and within a month, we had that training available for the people asking their questions and others. We also do training at your place or ours. As Greg mentioned, ACB went to Montreal recently. So we look at uh, handing these uh, appropriate trainings to the right people, and if we're not the right ones, we try to set that up for you. Uh, one more check on questions. No others showed up. So with that, this concludes our webinar today. On behalf of myself and the entire WLA team, I'd like to thank you all for attending and Greg for his excellent presentation. I will now close the meeting. Thank, thank you. you, Greg. Thank you.